Whether you savor the sound of a Harley or cover your ears when one roars by, the sight and sound is unmistakable and singularly American. On a quest to improve the bicycle almost 120 years ago, some young men unwittingly made history in a small shed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's hard to deny the rich history and avid loyalty they garner in a timeline that is littered with some very prosperous times as well as some very dark ones, including one point where Harley Davidson almost ceased to exist forever. So what was the secret to navigating through all the ups and downs of such an undulating past? As it turns out, it takes some real moxie, along with other curious tactics, to not only survive for almost 12 decades, but to forge a brand and attitude that cannot be duplicated. And Harleys no longer serve as just a practical means of transportation, but are for many part of their identity and even lifestyle. And not to worry, we have some of that random trivia goodness coming at the end. The Harley Davidson story starts way back in 1903 when William S. Harley and his childhood friend Arthur Davidson began creation of what would become the first ever Harley Davidson motorcycle, which was little more than a bicycle with a small motor attached to it. Though intended as a racer, it turned out that it needed a lot of work, and by the year 1906, many improvements had been made and 50 bikes were sold that year. But by 1909, Harley-Davidson was using a new V-twin engine capable of producing seven horsepower and top speeds of about 60 miles per hour and sold a little over 1,000 machines that year. 1909 also saw some events critical in setting up things nicely for the future. Arthur Davidson scores a perfect 1,000 points at the Federation of American Motorcyclists Endurance and Reliability Contest and three days later sets an FAM economy record of just over 188 miles per gallon. News of these impressive records spreads and popularity increases. Harley-Davidson also sells its first motorcycle to the Detroit Police Department, which later will play a big role in their success. And by 1914, Harley-Davidson was dominating motorcycle racing, passing their closest competition, Indian, and production swelled to over 16,000 machines. This domination constantly put their name in front of the public, further strengthening their reputation. But a big fork in the road was coming, and that was driven by Dub Dub One. The US military ended up purchasing over 20,000 motorcycles, and these machines not only proved valuable to the effort overseas, but was a boon to Harley-Davidson sales. And so by 1920, Harley-Davidson had become the world's largest motorcycle manufacturer producing over 28,000 bikes with over 2,000 dealers in 67 countries. And while the 1920s saw design improvements, the introduction of the teardrop gas tank, and even front wheel brakes, there was a big scary monster waiting over the next hill, the Great Depression. So bad was the Great Depression for Harley that sales fell from about 21,000 bikes in 1929 to a mere 3,700 in 1933, and were near bankruptcy. Despite this, they still gave it the old college try throughout the 1930s with a handful of seemingly bizarre decisions which ultimately paid off as Harley was the only motorcycle manufacturer to survive the depression. Aside from Indian, that is. You had the debut of the Servicar, which probably deserves a video of its own, but was originally aimed at the auto service industry where the Servicar would be towed behind the car being delivered back to the customer and then the delivery driver would unhitch the servicar and ride it back to the dealership or garage. It also became popular with small mobile service vendors and even police departments, and though production was stopped in 1973, it was still used by some law enforcement all the way into the 1990s. Harley then begins to paint Art Deco Eagle designs on all gas tanks, which was a first for the maker, aside from special orders. Harley-Davidson also unwittingly helped to foster the motorcycle industry in Japan by licensing tools, blueprints, and machinery to Sankyo, the parent company of Rikuo Motorcycle Company. And although that relationship would end almost before it began, the result was a licensed copy of a Harley-Davidson motorcycle made 100% in Japan, which was quickly iterated on and went on to be produced in various incarnations all the way into the late 50s. And although Harley-Davidson survived the 30s, Dub Dub 2 was very good for business, giving them the major kickstart they needed. So while they pressed pause on civilian production, 
they manufactured upwards of 90,000 military motorcycles. After 1945, they resumed mass civilian production, again becoming popular with private purchasers, some of which had been exposed to the bikes overseas. They were dominating on the race circuit as well. Now, if we fast forward a little to the 1950s, the seas of change were quite turbulent for Harley Davidson. As they celebrated their 50th anniversary, they also got some other revel-worthy news. Hindi Manufacturing, maker of the Indian motorcycle and Harley's only real U.S. competition, shutters its doors. And you had stars like Marlon Brando starting to popularize the bad boy image and its association with motorcycles, like in the movie The Wild One. More good news, right? Sort of. The good news was that motorcycles were getting a lot of free press and sales were climbing. The bad news was that some Americans were falling in love with the British Triumphs, BSAs, and Norton bikes for their smaller size, power, and innovative technology. Harley does try to counter with things like Elvis on a Harley in a 1956 issue of The Enthusiast, but this British invasion was about to be joined by another invasion from the land of the rising sun, Japan and their marketing would target anyone who wasn't a bad boy. Uh-oh. Harley looked to be in real trouble being assaulted from across the Pacific and the Atlantic. While sales of British bikes continued to do well in America throughout the 50s and even into the 60s, Honda seemed to come out of nowhere and showed they meant business. By 1959, they were the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world, and by 1961, there were hundreds of Honda dealers in the US and they were selling models specifically tailored for the American market. And their marketing was very clever. One ad said, you meet the nicest people on a Honda, suggesting in a subtle way that maybe Harley riders aren't so nice. The same ad showed families and even housewives riding on small Hondas, which conveyed that motorcycles were not death machines for hooligans, but family-friendly, fun transportation you could take on errands for a nickel's worth of gas. Harley tried to counter with smaller bikes like the Hummer, the Super 10, and the Sprint, and others, but the Japanese bikes were generally less expensive and more dependable. This Japanese invasion was threatening both European and American bikes, and there was good reason for them to be afraid. Hondas were selling like hotcakes, and other Japanese makers like Kawasaki and Yamaha were also starting to enter the U.S. market. In fact, Honda sales rose from just around a half a million dollars in 1960 to $77 million in 1965, the same year Harley-Davidson goes public. The American consumer now had a lot of choices, and many were not opting for Harleys. Harley-Davidson was in big trouble. By 1969, AMF, also known as American Machine and Foundry, bought Harley-Davidson for around $14 million. Yes, the same company that made bowling equipment, snow skis, and golf clubs. Their solution to turning around the faltering company was to cut the workforce and attempt to streamline production, which resulted in labor strikes. And though Evil Knievel used a Harley in his famous stunts and some models through the 70s were well received, on the whole Harleys were generally perceived as more expensive and less reliable bikes. Terms like hardly ableson and hardly drivable were thrown around, and all of a sudden the term hog wasn't such a good thing. On top of that, the Japanese weren't just making little two-stroke 50cc toys anymore, the tremendously successful Honda 750 being one example. And although AMF models are some of the more desirable bikes with collectors now, they weren't viewed that way at the time by many. AMF finally decided they wanted to dump Harley, but couldn't find any takers. Things looked to be over, and darkness was quickly closing in for a second time. And yet, there was a very small pinpoint of light at the end of the tunnel. In 1981, Harley execs arranged an $80 million leverage buyout deal underwritten by Citicorp, completed in 82. But now what? The long and arduous road of restoring their reputation is what? One very astute marketing tactic Harley used was that instead of trying to compete by matching the Japanese bikes head to head, they instead embraced the retro appeal idea. By refreshing classic bikes of yesteryear, they promoted the idea that all the things that Harley had come to be known for, good or bad, were representative of a rich American historical past, and buying a Harley now was the right choice if you wanted to be part of something bigger than yourself. Tapping into that powerful emotion of nostalgia was brilliant, but they didn't stop there. Willie Davidson said they were already working on new bikes that wouldn't be ready for three or four years and went on to say that a motorcycle is not a necessity, it has to do something for your ego. 
Yet by 1983, their market share had dropped to 23%, and that number was 78% just 10 years earlier. And although Harley was able to get a 45% tariff against imported Japanese bikes over 700 cc's, and things seemed to be turning around, by 84, Citicorp was getting cold feet knowing that the tariff would eventually come to an end and pulled funding. By 1985, it looked like Harley-Davidson would exist no more for the third time in just 15 years. To the rescue comes the Heller Financial Corp whose second-in-command, Bob Coe, was a Harley enthusiast himself. They ended up giving Harley-Davidson $49 million to buy out Citicorp, and by 1986, profits were a little over $4 million on sales of nearly $300 million, and the company went public for a second time. Things were so good by 1987 that Harley asked the ITC to repeal the tariffs on Japanese bikes one year early, and their share of the super heavyweight bike market was at an impressive 47%. And though the 1990 recession meant bad news for many, sales increased $75 million that year for Harley. Around that time, Harley also released a Sturgis model remake, as well as the Silver Fat Boy. You know, the one Arnold Schwarzenegger rode in Terminator 2. It was hugely popular. In fact, their share of the heavyweight market now had risen to 62%, with their next competitor Honda at a mere 16% and all the licensing of their logos that they did in the 1980s for shoes, beer, and even neckties positioned them to capitalize further in the brand space. The return of Harley-Davidson was official. During the 90s and 2000s, Harley had strong growth, save for a rough patch in 2009, mainly due to the economy and poorly performing acquisitions that had to be sold off. And although Harley-Davidson is doing well at the moment, things appear to be waning just a little bit. But again, Harley is betting big on change and placing one foot firmly in the future with their electric motorcycle dubbed the Livewire. Debuted as a prototype in 2014, is set to go into production very soon. With a top speed of 95 miles per hour, a 146 mile range, and a zero to 60 of three seconds, it could be the shot in the arm Harley needs before they need it. And although some of the Harley styling DNA comes through in things like the so-called tank, this isn't your dad's motorcycle anymore. Before we talk about all the random trivia goodness, I just wanted to take a brief moment to let you know another way you can support my efforts. I put dozens of hours into researching, writing, and editing every single video, and of course your YouTube subscription is always appreciated. But if you want to become a superstar and help me create more frequent content, consider becoming a patron. Thank you so much. All right, so now for that trivia hootenanny you have waited so patiently for. Harleys and most other bikes have their throttle on the right-hand side, but Indian motorcycles had their throttle on the left. Do you know why? Supposedly, police favored Indians back in the day so that they could throttle with their left hand while shooting with their right. Which is a cool bit of trivia, even if it is just a folkloric and historic myth. You've probably heard of Evinrude outboard boat motors, or maybe even own one. But did you know that Ole Evinrude assisted Arthur Davidson in the quest for a larger, more powerful engine very early on? Imagine if that relationship had gone different. We might be tooling around the lake with a Harley outboard or riding to Sturgis powered by an Evinrude. Did you know that after Harley Davidson went from evolving the bicycle to the motorcycle, they went the reverse route and launched a line of bicycles in 1917? They were trying to acclimate folks to motorcycles through the guise of something more genteel. Sadly, it didn't work, so they stopped in 1923. I gotta think a Harley bicycle is worth some coin today. So what's with all these terms like flathead, knucklehead, panhead, and shovelhead? In a nutshell, it refers to how different designs over the years reflect themselves in how the cylinders look externally. I'll throw a link in the description so you can check out all the deets. Now we all know that Harleys are lovingly referred to as hogs and even their stock ticker has been HOG since 2006, but where did this name come from? Starting back in 1920, there were some farm boys that were always winning races on Harleys and after a win, they would do a victory lap with their mascot aboard, a live pig. In 1983, Harley created a club with a play on the nickname, dubbing it the Harley Owners Group or Hog. They even tried to trademark the term, but lost that legal battle. Did you know that the US Army asked Harley to produce replicas of the German BMW R71 motorcycle? It's true. In the 1940s, the US military was intrigued by the Germans' use of motorcycles in battle as well as the machines themselves. 
They asked Harley to make 1,000 replicas which had opposing cylinders and a shaft drive, intended for use in the North African campaign. And though the resulting XA performed well, the campaign ended before they could be deployed. Harley-Davidson has survived and prospered through so many ups and downs because innovation was in their blood from the very start. Even when innovation was lacking, they made some hard choices that allowed them to survive and fight another day. And although most of their acquisitions didn't work out, they weren't afraid to try. And that was even more true with their merchandising, which has paid off by boosting their bottom line and reinforcing the brand. But most strikingly, they have become genius marketeers, selling the Harley-Davidson Americanness not just to Americans, but abroad. When you buy a Harley-Davidson motorcycle, you are really buying an identity. So here's to another 100 years. So, what do you think about Harley-Davidson as a company? Harley Motorcycles or the new Livewire electric bike? Let me know in the comments below. Also tell me what other video topics you might like to see on companies, history, food, or anything else really, and I'll consider it. This is 2-Bit History. Thank you for watching.